We are here Monday, December 14th, start of a new week. Wonderful stargazing. I hope you're having a great day wherever you are. I uh, hope you had a great weekend. I've got the chat room open. Uh, looking at everyone, Lynn, Claudia, Betty, nice of you to be here. I hope you had a great weekend. Teresa, you too. Uh, Marsha, uh, this is another week that we're starting and more stargazing. And of course, we've got to start with the Geminids. Have you seen the Geminid meteor shower? Has it been cloudy or clear? I hope you maybe have been able to see it virtually. Uh, I was ac actually on with uh, Astronomers Without Borders uh, that yesterday with live feeds from the Canary Islands, one of the darkest sites in the world, uh, up in the mountaintops on this island uh, that um, just beautiful skies, beautiful clear skies. And we saw some fireballs, really beautiful streaks of of meteors, at least virtually here in Montreal, Canada, where I am, I've been clouded out. Ah, I'm hoping maybe tonight, I, but it looks cloudy today, Monday. And the reason I'm talking about Gemini is because you can still see them. So these shooting stars are still visible. Um, and here on our uh, uh, planetarium program, you can see the what we call the radiant, the where the meteors appear to be coming out from. And uh, that is a spot in the sky occupied by the constellation Gemini. So this is showing you what the sky looks like um, basically at uh, uh, just after uh, sun, you know, sundown, about an hour or two after that, you've got the Geminid radiant rising in the northeast. So while the peak of the shower has occurred uh, in the early morning, pre-dawn hour, so in the hours before you start seeing uh, the uh, hints of dawn, uh, that's when the Geminid meteor shower was peaking. Locally, wherever you are in the world, it doesn't matter, uh, where in the pre-dawn hours of Monday morning was really the peak time for it. And with no moon in the sky, basically this is really an ideal condition to watch meteors. So if you do have clear skies and it's getting dark where you are on Monday night, December 14th, this is still a time to be able to see some of the Geminid meteor shower. It won't, will be past its ultimate peak, but there'll still be plenty of shooting stars, lots of wishes to be counting, uh, that is for sure. So uh, we've got um, uh, Chris from the UK. Debbie says it's raining in Dallas. Uh, Marcia says clouded out in Western North Carolina last night as well. Um, snowing in New Jersey, Jean Marie says uh, now was cloudy last night. Um, Lori says, was too cloudy in Chicago area. Can we see it tonight? Yes, indeed, Lori, do. If you get a clear sky time, and in fact, the rest of the week too, guys, uh, that is uh, still uh, you know, available to see straggler meteors. How many? Well, you can see perhaps upwards of 10, 15 shooting stars maybe per hour, uh, maybe a fireball thrown in. Fireballs are unusually bright meteors. Have you seen a fireball? I'd love to hear from you if you have. Um, Vladimir says, not lucky in Norway, too much clouds these days. Jackie says he's sick of the clouds in Alberta. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Here in Montreal, clouded out. Um, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to be able to see these unless I go virtual online hunting for someone uh, who has got a camera set up. Uh, Indiana, Rollins says cloudy there. Oh my gosh, all you guys have cloudy skies. Somebody's got to have clear skies. Who out there has clear skies? Tell me. Share with me. Sunny and cold in Atlanta, Georgia, Carol says. Good. Okay, so Carol, maybe you can be our hope for for all of us stargazers out there uh, hoping to see a shooting star tonight. Go out and see it for us, Carol. Um, see a few fireballs. That's right, Jackie. That's right. Um, Milton, Anthony and Milton, I guess that's in Ontario. All right, my Anthony, uh, Ontario, Canada, unfortunately clouded out there too. Oh, Daniel, Daniel says he saw four around midnight. Uh, and then the clouds moved in, uh, until 2 30 AM when you called it a night, right? Uh, 
Um, so I don't know. I mean, you know, the lot of the activity was happening earlier in the night too. And by the way, talking about sky activity, I've got to, I got to share with you guys, uh, my, from my friends at spaceweather.com. Let me zoom in a little bit there. Um, you, there is actually a solar flare, uh, that is possible that has possibly created what is called a CME. A CME is a coronal mass ejection, basically a gigantic cloud of charged particles that may have been released from the sun December 14th today uh, at 1437 universal time. So that would be um, not, uh, ba, 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 when would that be? That would be nine around 937 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, where I am in Montreal, this is what the solar flare that caused that possible charged particle cloud that might be heading towards Earth. This is a movie t uh, in um, different wavelength from what you can see with the eye, but it picks up the activity. And you can see right there, that's that solar flare. And what's interesting, what they're reporting here at spaceweather.com, which I thought was very interesting, is that it caused... Uh, it created this this flare, uh, let go, this flare that you see, let go of some X-rays. And those X-rays travel through space at the speed of light. And of course, at the speed of light, uh, at 300,000 kilometers per second, uh, the sun is eight and a half light minutes away. It takes light eight and a half minutes to get here, which means that this X-rays coming from this explosion on the surface of the sun reached us in eight and a half minutes. And sure enough, there was uh, actually some shortwave radio blackout over South America. Uh, that is, I thought, was very interesting. You can see right here where that X-ray flux was happening. Very interesting, centered over South America, as you can see. So there was a disruption in shortwave radio. There was a blackout, which it came as a result of this X-ray being thrown off of uh, out of this solar flare. Now, along with that, it could be a, a, a bunch of charged particles that could be coming from uh, this cloud. And if it is directed towards Earth, it can slam into our planet's magnetic field, which gets rattled, and these uh, charged particles can funnel themselves through the north and south pole of the Earth and create auroras. It's possible. So right now, uh, you know, they uh, you have to stay tuned for updates. Uh, we might have uh, a CME, uh, coronal mass ejection, that's heading towards us. We'll know in the next few days by Wednesday, Thursday, we may get some more. I'll keep an eye on it and just keep an eye on my timeline. If you're watching on Facebook, I always put stuff there on Instagram, on Twitter feed as well. And if you're on YouTube as well, I'll put it into the posts if I can uh, there to if there's any, uh, you know, serious updates regarding the possibility of, of, of northern lights. And by the way, we're heading towards the season of northern lights right now, peak time, this time of the year into spring, winter and spring, great time to see uh, auroras. And the sun is going through a lot more activity. It's heading into a new solar cycle, more activity. We've seen sunspots, and therefore we think there may be more auroras in the way. Wouldn't that be cool to see northern lights? So hopefully that comes to pass and we get to see uh, some really cool stuff. So why don't we get back to our night sky and we'll see what is up this week as well. So the Geminids definitely should be on your radar Monday, December 14th. Uh, that is for sure. Now, if we move to Tuesday, Tuesday night, I'm going to switch this over Tuesday night. And we'll do just after sunset. And we move over to the southwest. And lo and behold, what you'll see is an extremely thin crescent moon on December 15th. Again, this is December, December 15th, very soon after your local sunset, about a half hour after your local sunset. And if you have a really good view to the very low southwestern horizon, this is what will greet you. The moon will be this razor thin, whisker thin crescent. Look at that. And this is going to be a real challenge, guys, real challenge to see because it's so close to the uh, southwestern horizon. It's very close to the sun. Remember, 
we had a solar eclipse on December 14th, Monday. Today, as I'm taping this, we just finished a solar eclipse in South America, which means the moon, right, was in front of the sun. It was aligned with the sun. That's when you get solar eclipses. So, uh, as you could expect, the moon has moved off the side. So in about a day and a half from now, on Tuesday evening, December 15th, the moon will be far enough away from our vantage point here on Earth to be able to be glimpsed for those keen-eyed of you that are out there can see this is that whisker thin moon and then what will be a good guidepost where to look for the moon if you're up for that challenge of course the pairing of saturn and jupiter it's a great pairing uh, uh to to watch and what will be interesting is if we move it to wednesday december 16th Look what you see. On December 19th, the moon will be a fatter crescent, still so beautifully thin, really, really an eye catcher. And it will be paired with this beautiful pairing of gas giants, Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, Tina from Finland, hello. Uh, Shelly says, the skies opened up for a short time in the West San, Fer San Fernando Valley and was able to see the meteor shower. Fantastic. Daniel says, it was cloudy the rest of the night. It's been raining since at least daybreak. Uh, overcast, yes. And then, oh, Mary Jane, I'm in New Zealand. And last night I saw two, two meteors. Fantastic. So you see, around the world, everyone can get to see some shooting stars. It's a lot of fun. So, But if we talk about what we see on Wednesday, our focus attention will be just after your local sunset. And you'll see that crescent moon snuggling up to this pair of stars that will look like stars, but we know that those are planets. Those are the two gas giant worlds that are visible ever close. And if you've been watching them, if you've been on my channel, you know what's to come. It's this historic super conjunction, what we call a conjunction. is the It's the astronomical jargon for saying that it's a close approach. It's like an encounter between two um, ob uh, celestial objects very, very close together. So when two planets or the planet and moon come together, we call this a conjunction. When the two planets come together so close and this approach of them is historic. We haven't seen that in 800 years. Uh, we won't see it for many, many decades to come. This is the only chance in our lifetime we'll see it this close between these two planets. And uh, it's just very impressive to be able to see them getting so, and that will happen on December 21st is when they were at, at their absolute closest. And let me just quickly uh, bring up a website. I forgot to show this. I think it's worthy of uh, mention. Um, if I can get this going, let's see. Uh, maybe it might not want to, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, it doesn't seem to want to do that. Well, all right. But uh, I will put a link to this website, Astronomers Without Borders. They have a uh, Jupiter-Saturn conjunction observing program called Beauty Without Borders. Really uh, a wonderful uh, project where we're asking people to see if they can look at the conjunction of these two planets, Saturn and Jupiter, and can they distinguish them as two separate stars or do you see them as one star? And you can... Uh, send us photographs as well. So that, I'll put a link to that in the comment section, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, um, please just wait and I'll be have it. <laughs> I'll have that for you uh, there. Uh, now, if we move on to Thursday, again, Thursday, the moon will have moved over a little bit onto the other side of the pairing of, of these gas giants. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous view. This is December 17th, Thursday evening, soon after sunset and you may have a lot more time to see it too just as darkness falls you can see it's in the constellation capricornus uh that is where the moon will lie that beautiful crescent moon and what i want you to look for now this is something really really cool uh i want you to take a look uh, i'm gonna zoom out you can see where we're talking about in the southwest sky hanging low will be jupiter and saturn in the southwest sky, and then the moon to the left of it. Now, what I want you to see is something called Earthshine. I don't know if you've seen this before. Some of you may not know about this, but if you look at the moon carefully, 
when it's a crescent moon like this, especially when it's a thin crescent, you may notice that there is a, you can see the dark unlit portion of the disk of the moon. And that unlit, that even though it's much darker than the crescent, right? But you can still see those marias, those darker markings, the splotches and the lighter markings, right? You must have seen this at one point may, in your life, maybe outdoors. You, you, you probably just noticed it quickly and, and then forgot about it. But what's really cool, this effect of being able to see the d unlit portion of, of the disk of the moon is called earth shine. And what it's caused from, it, that's also really, really cool because the cause of this is the sunshine, sunlight, shining onto the earth's clouds, very reflective clouds, very reflective uh, bodies of water, large bodies of our, our oceans, like the Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, larger, and they are very reflective, like a mirror. And the sunlight bounces off of the water and then goes back into space and it illuminates the dark side of the moon. So when you're looking at this, that you can see that dark portion, you can see it, that it's a full circle, the moon. Well, that darker portion is lit up by the earth because it's so bright because of the sunshine. So the daytime side of the, of the earth, uh, that reflected sunlight off our oceans is what lights up the darker side of the, the, the disk of the moon. And we call that earth shine. And this week, as we have this crescent moon uh, in our skies, as we see them in our skies, this is the best time this week to find that earth shine effect. So I'll put that out to you guys, another observing challenge. See if you can spot earth shine on the moon's disk, something very, very cool. So check that out. That happens regularly. If you miss it this time, Pam, I see you're in the midst of a week-long snow event. No problem. There'll be other uh, months where you'll be able to see it. The, the, the moon goes through its cycles every four weeks you'll get a chance to see Earth shine. The next time you see a crescent moon, take a look at that. It's a lot of fun. So what else is there to see? Um, definitely, uh, if you wait until darkness falls, uh, let's say any time this week, you'll be able to see one of the farthest objects in the it, what the human eye can see is Andromeda. And with the moon out of the way in later in the evening, it will set early because it's following the sun still for most of this week. So you get pretty dark skies. That's why the Geminids have been so good to see the meteor shower. But beyond the Geminids, there's a lot of what we call deep sky objects, objects that are beyond the solar system. And one of the best ones to see is the Andromeda galaxy. Andromeda galaxy is in the constellation of its namesake, Andromeda, right there, the princess uh, in ancient Greek and Roman mythology. Andromeda sits next to Perse uh, Pegasus, which is the uh, flying horse, of course. Uh, her mother, Queen Cassiopeia, is there. Uh, Cepheus, her father, is there as well, all bunched up. It's like a great big celestial soap opera, that mythology that in encompasses all these characters. And what's interesting is Andromeda is a galaxy that is the farthest object the human eye can see, the unaided human eye. So if you have no telescope or binoculars, this is as far as you can see. So the distance is 2.7 million light years away. That's how far away Andromeda sits. It looks like a little tiny fuzzy patch from a dark sky. So if you're outside of a, a city and you have dark countryside uh, skies, you can see it as a fuzzy little patch with the naked eye. It's quite amazing to, of a feat to be able to see. And what you're looking at, that little fuzzy patch, I know it looks very unassuming, but it really is amazing because it is a island of stars, a gigantic, like our Milky Way galaxy that we live in. But this one is uh, is quite a bit bigger. It's also called a spiral galaxy. It's a you can think of it as a flat like a pin. It's pinwheel shaped, flattened like a disc, and we're kind of seeing it almost edge on at an angle, in fact. So you see some of the spiral arms coming out to the sides here in this photograph. 
that's in my planetarium program. There are smaller galaxies we call satellite galaxies that are nearby. Uh, that's what that's what this is. There over here, you can see one of them highlighted, right? And you can see the other one highlighted over here. That's M32, M30, uh, uh, M10, 110, and of course M31 is the major galaxy in itself. This is all really M. When I say M, it's related to the Messier catalog. It's a well-known deep sky backyard stargazer uh, um, list of objects, uh, some of the brighter objects for backyard telescopes and binoculars. And so uh, M30, M31 um, is uh, also known as the Andromeda Galaxy. It is 2.7 million light years away. That's how long the light takes to reach us. And it is home to hundreds of billions of stars. And that's the combined light of all those stars that you're actually seeing. I mean, it's really incredible, isn't it? So, folks, this is a challenge I put out to you. See the farthest the human eye can see. Now, if you have light polluted skies, definitely you're not going to be able to see this. But with binoculars, a cinch, an easy target to see. And how you go about finding it now, you can start using a number of guideposts in the sky. So again, this is any time this week of December 14th with the moon out of the way, it's a great time to see it in the late night skies. So you wait until the moon drops out of the scene by mid evening, late evening, no problem. It'll be dark enough. So you can have different ways of, of finding Andromeda. One of the ways is of course using Mars, that red planet, very bright star-like object to know which uh, orientation to face. So that's basically towards the southern skies or the southern compass direction, cardinal direction that you're looking at. And then what you're looking for is a giant square in the sky. That giant square is the chest of Pegasus the horse. So that giant square, it's called the Great Square of Pegasus, and you look for those four medium bright stars. They're not very bright, but they're visible from even suburban skies. And what you're looking beside that, off to the corner star, one of the corner stars that's called Alpharats. Alpharats is where the head of Andromeda is connected to. I know what you're thinking, guys. Don't go there. It's, I know her head is connected to the back end of the flying horse. I didn't make this up. This is from the Greek mythology, but that's how they have her. She's connected to um, that giant square, the great square of Pegasus. That's where Andromeda constellation is, the namesake of the great Andromeda galaxy that we're trying to hunt down this week. And so what you'll see is a bunch of stars kind of running parallel, two stars, two lines of stars. And you can see, starts with Alpharets, which is the corner star of uh, this uh this uh, great, let me just see if I can move out here a little bit for you guys. There we go. And you can see here uh, that uh, Alpharets is the beginning of where V, there's this V shape of stars that come out, a V line of stars. You can see I'm marking them off here with my cursor. And if you go to the second set, so you go off from Alpharets, you'll go to two stars that are a little bit farther away from each other. They're taking their own path. And then to the left of those is two other stars, a little bit farther away. The one Mirac is a little bit brighter and orange than the one above it. So they're fairly easy to see with the naked eye. And then what you do is you draw an imaginary line between these two stars and you extend that up to another, about the same amount, this is what we call star hopping, you reach Andromeda galaxy. Now you can do all of this with nothing more than a pair of binoculars and you can actually get oriented that way and see the whole thing very easily. And this is about what you would see through a pair of binoculars. You can see both Mirac and this top star together. And if you just extend it, that's where your view, just scan with binoculars, you'll reach the Andromeda galaxy. And you can do that with nothing more than a pair of binoculars. Now, if you have a telescope, it'll look a little bit more impressive. Not like this. This is a photograph 
uh, that somebody actually took, right? So I can show you a close up. It's just gorgeous. It's uh, it's worth looking at. Here you go. Taken by Robert Gendler, uh, a long exposure photograph of our neighboring spiral, large spiral galaxy Andromeda, 2.7 million light years away, home to probably, you know, at least 600 billion stars, maybe even up to a trillion stars. You can't see the individual stars. You know those the stars that you're seeing, the individual dots of stars, by the way, in this picture? Those are stars in our own galaxy that are in the foreground. They're kind of photobombing on this picture of Andromeda. Those individual dots that you're seeing scattered across this picture, those don't belong to Andromeda. We cannot see with a small backyard telescope the individual stars that make up this uh, galaxy. They look like clouds. They're just all mushy kind of clouds. They're all bunched up together, and you can't you only see the combined light. That's because they're so far away at 2.7 billion. Uh, light years. So we see the combined light of billions of stars, and that's what forms this beautiful glow, this oblong glow that we can see. And with a backyard telescope and binoculars, you will actually only see the core. You see where my um, uh, cursor is? You're probably, with binoculars, you only see the intense, compact core, the downtown core of the galaxy. And all of this, this outside, these all these beautiful spiral uh, uh, shape that, that that's coming out, that stuff is only really visible through backyard, uh, large backyard telescopes, hints of those. And you need to take photographs like this to really see the full extent. And by the way, this takes up so much space in the sky, um, multiple moons can be the full moon. You know how much it takes up in the sky? You can actually stack like six, seven of them at least to make to span out the the milk, uh, <laughs> the Andromeda galaxy. That's how much space in the sky it actually takes up for us. If it was so bright that we could see the entire extent, you'd be pretty impressed of how much chunk of the sky the Andromeda galaxy can actually take up. But Alas, with the naked eye, we see hints of that core. All of that is visible in the southern sky. Another way to find Andromeda very quickly um, is to um, use the Cassiopeia group of stars, uh, Cassiopeia constellation right next door that's up here. Um, and if you use, it's a dub, giant W, right? That's what it looks like. And if you use the right side of that W and it's like a pointer, you, it almost points directly to uh, the Andromeda galaxy. You could scan that with binoculars. That's all you need to do. So that's a really fun, uh, fun, fun project to do uh, anytime this week. So there you go, folks. You've got Geminids to see, perhaps some auroras, and uh, you've got the deep sky object of my favorite is the Andromeda galaxy, which is visible anytime this week. So in the next clear night you have, give it a try. Let your eyes adapt. Uh, make sure you let your eyes adapt for, I would say, at least 15 minutes to darkness. No bright lights, no, no smartphones uh, lighting up uh, your, uh, your, your face. That'll ruin your night vision. You want to let your eyes adapt to darkness as much as possible. Same goes for Geminids. If you want to see as many meteors as possible, let your eyes adapt to it. So that's it. Phew, a lot of stuff. And I'll put everything in um, my uh, comment section. Now, I've got a surprise for you guys. All of you guys that stuck with me, I've got a surprise. I, um, as you may know, uh, I've published a book, some book, a couple of books with National Geographic. Uh, National Geographic is a fantastic organization. I've been involved with them for 12 years now. I've uh, been a uh, columnist for them, a uh, book writer, online presence, a speaker. Uh, it's just a fantastic organization. They do so much good, and uh, their photography is amazing, and the science that they reveal uh, to the general public is is really incredible, and I've been really fortunate enough to be associated with them, uh, revealing, of course, the night sky to all of you around the world, which is my pleasure. And one of my, you know, books that I'm so proud of is uh, the Backyard Guide to the Night Sky that I have here. 
uh, yeah, it's something, a work of love for me. I've worked on it for uh, about two years uh, when it came out last year, 2019. It was a work of love. And it has got covers everything, not just about the science, but as the name suggests, Backyard Guide to the Night Sky means that it helps you find your way around the night sky. And uh, it has all the sky charts that you need to go. I've got also star hopping uh, sky charts for you. All the things that I talk about in my videos here, my live streams that you're watching on YouTube or Facebook or Twitch, this is the stuff that I, I, I've put into this book. Made sure that I make it as easy as possible for you to find uh, things in the sky and to continue in the hobby. This book isn't going to be everything that, you, that you'll probably want. You'll want other books and other resources and, and software and binoculars and telescopes. But this will get you going. It gives you an idea of what the hobby ha can be. And it's not dumbed down, but it's made very easy for anyone, any or true beginner, if you don't know anything about the sky. It's a great book to, to begin with. And um, I'm really excited because... Uh, my publisher says that well, I can give away some copies. And so for the next few weeks, I'll be giving out a copy for, during each of my broadcasts to one of you lucky people. And uh, so I, for the 10th person who puts in the comment section the words clear skies, the 10th person, I will give a, uh, a copy. Now, you have to be, with one exception, North America, Canada, and the U.S. Unfortunately, can only go out to put people in Canada and the U.S. So if you're in Canada and U.S. and you put the words clear sky in the comment section, the 10th person to do that, I will count it. I will give you a, I'll contact you and uh, we'll send you a copy of the Backyard Guide to the Night Sky. How's that? Okay, so and then maybe you can uh, you can find it useful. I hope you do. Uh, it's been very far. I've been tickled pink. It's a it's a bestseller on Amazon now uh, in multiple lists in science, math, and astronomy. Uh, top ranked book right now because of you. Thank you very much for your support, everyone. And because of that, uh, I was so excited to be able to give do a giveaway. So clear skies. That's what I'm looking for. Tenth person to put that in. I'll make that count and we'll see who that is. And I will contact you uh, through make sure that your contact is there and I'll reach out and we'll get your mailing address and mail one out to you. All right. So thanks again for, for tuning in. I'll be here again next week, Monday. Every Monday I'm here on my YouTube and Facebook and Twitch channel. And if you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? You don't want to miss on, on any of these amazing night sky stuff, me, the auroras, meteor showers, conjunctions, all of that. I cover everything and try to make it easy and fun for all ages. So I hope you're staying safe and healthy and keep watching my timelines. I always put up neat stuff all week. You don't want to miss it. So make sure you get notified and subscribe and follow. So until next video, I hope you stay safe and healthy. And I wish all of you guys, of course, as I always do, clear skies. Bye-bye.